he's talked about the terroir is all about interaction. And I will talk about the interaction between wine and consumer. I will talk more about the sensory. And we did a really big trial also over five years. And I think we have some really interesting data to show you. Um, this is my terroir. I'm working here at the Wein Campus in Neustadt. You see it is located here in the southern, southwestern part of Germany. We have good conditions there. And beyond, besides of a very successful bachelor program, we start this year also with an English-speaking Master of Business Administration in Wine, Sustainability and Sales. Good. This is a picture from a small winery in the Pfalz region and the distance is just three kilometers of this map and you see there are five very distinct bedrocks like granite, limestone, reddish slate. And you question that the bedrock does not have too much to say about the soil where the wine is rooting in, you see actually here with the Grauwacke, for example, that's just maybe 40, 50 centimeters, or here as well with the granite. So it is amazing how close these bedrocks are located in the Pfalz because there the Rheingraben just collapsed and very old material was coming up at uh, the foothills of the Pfälzer Forest. And that's the reason why quite a few people in this area, but also Austria, for example, they label on the wine from the Schiefer red slate or Muschelkalk, which means limestone. Or, and they, so this is very important that we transform it to the consumer. And for this reason, my definition of terroir includes very important that is a sensorial perception dimension of and the other factors you're all aware of. If we don't bring these sensory differences to the consumers, they don't care really so much about terroir. And if this terroir has a sustainable impact on the sensory expression of the wines, we have actually something very authentic, a very authentic feature of a vineyard, and that's very important for the future because we have a unique selling proposition in the growing global competition of wines, and we, yeah, we safeguard a little bit these smaller producers. So I wanted to show you a little bit some exemplary comparisons of two bedrocks by sensory means, then we go a little bit into multivariate patterns, then I try to combine Cl uh, soil and climate data to explain some sensory data and finally look also a little bit into aroma compounds. And this is the first comparison I would like to show. Two vineyards. One is driven by basalt. You see the, there was a volcano over here in the Forster Pechstein and a sandstone with a lot of cobbles here from the Deisesheimer Kieselberg. And this vineyard, both vineyards are managed by the same producer. And if we compare this now by sensory means, we have this profile coming from the sandstone and the blue one from the basalt. And each point is an average of 20 judges tasting the wine three times. So it's 60 individual points we are averaging. So it's very robust what we're looking at. And clearly the basalt soils yields a wine with more peach, more grapefruit character, more mango passion fruit while the sandstone is much more driven by a harsh, uh, hard mouthfeel, acidity, more sourness, and less of this exotic flavor compounds. And Antonio talked two days ago about the tipping point of terroir, and this was in a vintage where we had a long vegetation period. The next vintage was a short vegetation period, it was warmer, and look what happened if we compare these two profiles, the difference is much smaller. So we lose some of this sensory terroir edge. So people won't really follow us when we say terroir really matters for the taste of this Riesling. So here, when we have longer, uh, smaller, shorter, hotter vegetations, we run into the problem that the terroir is not as decided. At least for Riesling, I'm not an expert in other uh, varieties. So determining the tipping point, this sensory is very important and helpful. And you see here, when we are getting too early and we have some rain, the very thin-skinned Riesling starts to burst and then Botrytin is having a party and we're having a problem. And that's the reason why we have to uh, um, harvest earlier than we would like to. The last comparison is between 
two sites, 150 kilometers apart, Pfalz region and the Mosel region, but having the same bedrock, which is a road leak in this. And we look at this, this is very uncommon for the Mosel to have this reddish uh, slate, but this is typical for the Urziger Wurzgarten, which means a spicy garden. So they knew already that this is a little bit different to the normal, more apple or citrus driven Riesling from bluish or grayscale. And when we compare this then to the um, Castanian bush, you, we always have also have this reddish slate here, the Rotlegendes. And now, if you compare a Mosel Riesling <laughs> with a Pfalz Riesling, it's amazing how close they are. If you look at these two profiles, wow. they just differ a little bit in apple, rhubarb, uh, and bitterness. One had definitely 1% more alcohol and hard mouthfeel, but they really agreed on a lot of these. Kind of, so that's very nicely to show that there is some uh, common bracket uh, due to this common bedrock. Now let's go a little bit into the multivariate statistics. We were very fortunate to have 24 individual vineyard sites. We had four to five vintages and seven different bedrock types. Uh, you show here like porphyr or basalt, ready slate, and two different limestone types. And we first run, of course, an analysis of variance, and we were a little bit disappointed to see that the 24 vineyard sites don't differ too much. They differ quite a bit in acidity, which is maybe more important to differentiate Riesling terroir than the smell, than the odor compounds. And the bedrock was even a little bit more disappointing because we had only two left. But then look what's happened. We were not only fermenting the wines under standardized condition, we did it also in the wineries using the same yeast. And look, vinification had a far higher impact on uh, the differentiation than the bedrock type or the vineyard side. So for this reason, I'm very busy in telling our winemakers we have a strong need for a non-invasive enology. In enology, what does it mean non-invasive? In order to focus on these subtle sensory differences we are getting from the terroir, winemaking should exploit the grape, the grape material, because it's telling the story from the vineyard, but it should avoid its own stylistic statement, which may mask the terroir expression. So this means reduce crop for Riesling, that's the figures we are using, cautious defoliation, delayed picking, and maybe stepwise hand picking, so picking it two or three times uh, the same vineyard, destemming, maceration on the skins to favor the transport of the bound aroma compound into the juice from the skin, rigid juice clarification, and inoculation with good fermenting yeast, no spontaneous fermentation. Many people will shock their head, but very often due to limitation in nitrogen, these spontaneous fermentation have a strong statement by their self, which has nothing to do with the vineyard, but with creating sulfur off flavors and other things. And now look at this PCA of 105 wines we sampled across five vintages from different sides. And of course we see some overlap. But we don't, for example, see an overlap of basalt versus slate here. And um, these are actually all coming from the Pfalz, so it's just maybe 20, 30 kilometers distance between these two sides. Limestone do overlap a little bit. Sandstone is different from the basalt and the reddish slate. Of course, when we group them according to the bedrock type, we neglect climatic and other factors, but it's still amazing how how small these um, um, groupings is, and so there is a common pattern what we can see. And these are the central factors driving it, acidity versus sweetness, so the absence of acidity, the, all the wines were dry and smoky, honey caramel and rhubarb taste. When we look now in the effects, standardized versus the estate, it was very interesting to see that when the wine estates are doing the wines on six different bedrock types, they were very successful to discriminate them. So we learned that the wine estates has a knowledge, an acquired knowledge over long, long years with these vineyards, how to make them more distinct after fermentation. And we were not as good doing this in our pilot winery 
And this is, uh, they like to hear this, and it's a strong favor that you really have to know your vineyards in order to bring this terroir even more expressive than now. Good. And here, a smaller site. Rob Bramley always said it's good, terroir is good for smaller sites, but not over big distances. Here we're looking maybe a distance of 20, 25 kilometers, and indeed, these four vintages all coming from the wineries are not overlapping much except for the very shallow rotlegendes, which was very much stressed in the warm year 2005. And these are the sensory driving factors. Good. Let's try to explain this now a little bit. So we dig the soil pits and we had help from our geology department in Rheinland-Pfalz who helped to do the chemical and the physical analysis. We got some data from the climate. The first thing, what we actually did, we, we measured the water potential pre-dawn, quite a bit of work. And we see the water potential is over here. So we have here the more negative one. So the water stress is up here. There was no water stress. I think that's one of the first things about Riesling that we could show that some water stress, and we're talking about 0 0.6, 0 0.7 uh, megapascal. It's not really heavy water stress. But this water stress had indeed a certain positive connotation to the wines because I think floral, mango, passion fruit, a color, uh, is positive, but when we have no water stress, the acidity was much more uh, uh, stronger and some of the mineral taste. And the minerality we really tasted according to a standard we all agreed on. I'm a student of Ennoble, so we never do something without having an uh, appropriate standard. And we see here now when we look at the limestone that had more water stress, was more tending to this mango passion fruit versus the slate versus the road league in this, the basalt and the sandstone. In the next step, we did the following. We did a partial least regression. We took the 70 soil and climate parameters, which were independent. They were defining what kind of grapes we were harvesting. And the dependent variable is the sensory, because they are coming from the grapes after fermentation. And so we tried to model this, and we received the loadings, and the scores for the 14 wines we could put into this model. And the first thing I wanted to draw your attention to is that it's quite good to model already with two PLS factors, um, uh, roughly 50% of the variation. And when we went one PLS factor further, we could model nearly 76% of the soil and climate data. And I just want to highlight, because we don't have the time, Gravel content and the rainfall, for example, we yield really nice R squares for acidity, harsh acidity, and hard mouthfeel. And some of you will say, no, that's not correct with the gravel content. This cannot be. Indeed, it is a little bit strange. And we, when we made the soil pit, we really saw that there is a little stream coming under the vineyard in two or three meters depth. That's the reason why. So it's a correlation, but it's not a causal correlation. It's a good example for this. Other ones are easier to explain, like the floral, sand content, solar radiation. If we have sandy soil, the water holding capacity is very low. And what happens is that the basal leaves are senescent and they are dropping. And so there's more radiation, more um, sun exposure to the Riesling. And of course, the monoterpenes are formed in a higher number. And this explains the increased floralness. Or the cantaloupe was quite well explained by the growing degree days, number of summer days, calcium exchangeable content of the soil clay contained, and the plant available water. So this is good to make new hypotheses. And here we can go on with more specific experiments, which we unfortunately lack some money for, um, to really prove these hypotheses. So in the final, in the last two minutes, a little bit about aroma compounds. We are going now to the northern part of the pulse. And here we see now winery and standardized together. And isn't that amazing? This is not a discriminant analysis. This is a PCA. We're not fostering this clustering. And it's amazing. For example, these limestones are not overlapping uh, with this one. These are actually very close together, the same winery. These are adjacent vineyards in the same Pechstein, and still they are a little bit different. 
partially because we have different wineries making them, and the sandstone doesn't overlap at all with the limestone or with here. So it is amazing how close we are with the roughly 200 Oroma compost. Actually, we only took about 40, which were significant due to an analysis of an uh, ANOVA. ANOVA. Here we see some of them, the petrol flavor, TDN, phenyl ethanol, which has a floral character, uh, the smoky vinyl guyacol or the floral linalol, among other esters or terpenes which are involved in here. So I wanted to conclude. For different difference, we, we could show terroir difference with... Uh, oh, sorry, I was jumping. So the first component is very important. Terroir differences without sensory significance is an academic concept, I think, without much impact on the market. If the consumers cannot taste the difference, smell the difference, they don't really care for this concept. We could show that we could classify terroir according to the bedrock material, which yields good separation due to sensory properties, even better due to aroma compounds. And it's important that individual winemaking in wineries yielded more sensory difference as standardized winemaking. So if you know your vineyard really good, you are better in discriminating them due to the sensory. And we need this non-invasive winemaking in order to make the subtle sensory signal perceptible and not masking it by our winemaking. And finally, I think we're wrong when we're looking which terroir gives up the better wine. It's not about value, it's about sensory diversity. And I think sensory diversity is a new synonym for really wine quality because our total wine quality improved so much that we are more about the diversity and that's what we should be interested in. And terroir is a very important source for this diversity. At the end, some acknowledgement for the funding from our ministry, and I have at least one picture of the two PhD students, Stefan Kuszynski and Andrea Bauer, who is now a professor at Hamburg University. And finally, have a look after I'm finishing one minute late, uh, about our master program, which is a uh, uh, an executive one, so people only have to be a very short time in Germany, in Neustadt, uh, the rest there can work at home and they do a lot of case studies in their own companies or in the companies they're working to and it will be great if you give this to people who are interested in such an MBA program. Thank you very much.